Hey everybody, thanks for joining us here today. This is Nicole with Topaz and I'm super excited to welcome back Joel Wolfson. Hi Joel. Hey Nicole, how's it going? Good, thanks. Uh, Joel is here to present Optimizing for Output. And whether you're making large fine art prints or publishing your photos on Facebook, you always want them to look their best. So regardless of your chosen output, you want to prepare your images optimally with a proper sharpening workflow and the right tonality, contrast, and color. So today we are here with internationally published photographer and digital imaging expert Joel Wolfson. He's going to show you how to prepare images for the best possible output no matter what or where you're going to be putting um, that image. He's going to be integrating Topaz plugins like Detail plus Photo Effects Lab with his Lightroom and Photoshop uh, workflow and show you a more sensible and efficient system for the best possible output. Joel's roster of notable clients include Newsweek, L17, Houghton Mifflin, and corporate clients such as Apple, AT&T, 3M, United Airlines, yet he is best known for his artistic images and unexpected views of everyday places around the globe. And he's also really well known for his workshops and teaching ability, so definitely check that out. I will be um, giving you all the information about his workshops and how to get in touch and keep in touch with Joel at the end of the session as well. So with that, let me go ahead and turn over my screen to Joel. Now, hopefully you can all see my screen. So welcome everyone, and uh, thanks a lot for joining us. It's great to be back doing another webinar for Topaz. Um, as Nicole mentioned, I'm going to be addressing optimizing for output. Uh, um, output, of course, can mean a lot of different things, but whether it's your inkjet printer or you're just uh, putting an image up on Facebook, you still want it to look its best. So um, what I want to do first is sort of clarify what's needed for output. And I kind of put together this little list of things that I do on virtually every image to, uh, as, as sort of a formula for everything that's needed to get good output. Uh, the ones that you see in bold are the ones that I'm going to concentrate most on today. Now, most people are aware that you need to do some sharpening in your image, but not everybody uses a sharpening workflow. Um, or may, you may not even be familiar with what a sharpening workflow is. So basically, a sharpening workflow is divided in, into three steps. Uh, the first being capture sharpening. What does that mean? Basically, that's to recover any loss of sharpness that happened during uh, the creation of your digital image. Now, in most cases, that means just shooting a picture with a digital camera. Most digital cameras have what's called an anti-aliasing filter or low-pass filter in front of the sensor which purposefully um, makes it a little bit softer and they do that to try to avoid uh, various artifacts and things called mores. Um, so the manufacturers in most cases put those in the cameras. There are a few cameras that don't have them or minimize it um, but even those cameras, sometimes you want to do a little bit of capture sharpening. And if you scan film, you have similar issues in that there is a loss of sharpness uh, through the scanning process to convert it to a digital image. So basically, you want to be doing that on every single image um, that you're working with digitally before you think about any type of output or um, as part of the process of creating your master file. So the other part is selective. Sometimes intent sharpening and that's pretty much what it sounds like. That's targeting specific areas of the image uh, to sharpen them. Uh, generally it's for creative purpose but sometimes it's just technical so you might want to accentuate the eyes in a portrait and sharpen up the eyes a little bit more than the rest of the image to uh, have your viewers attention go there. Technical side you might be compensating for the fact that a lot of uh, lenses may not be as sharp say in the corners as they are in the center and things like that but in the end it's targeted sharpening. Output sharpening really is math and what do I mean by that? Basically if you've done all the rest of the proper steps to your image such as the capture sharpening and the creative sharpening and you have proper tone color balance all that sort of stuff um, output sharpening is basically a calculation of how your printer, let's say, is putting ink on the paper, what size your image is. So it's contingent on the size and the media that you're going to. Now the media could be 
just the web, or the media could be uh, canvas, velvet fine art paper, glossy photographic paper, whatever it is. Um, so I, I will go through how I do all of these um, and what my workflow is to get there, and we'll do that with a few example images. Um, the other thing that I have on here is sense, a sense of depth, and <clears throat> I do this on almost every image. There are a few exceptions. Uh, occasionally I have an image um, like this one here, uh, where the whole idea is that it's two-dimensional, but this is really an exception. Most images, whether it's a landscape, architecture, whatever it is, uh, we often want to add a sense of depth. And it's, it, it's fairly subtle, but it's very effective. Um, when I do a show or I'm doing a gallery opening or something like that, I, I often get the comment, wow, I feel like I can walk into your photo or I, I really, it really looks three-dimensional. And part of accomplishing that is, is uh, using some techniques, which I'll show you, that add um, this sense of depth. And, and really it's just sort of an increase in contrast, um, maybe a little bit of sharpening of edges and that sort of thing, and it's, it's pretty subtle, but you'll see how it works. So with that, let's go to an actual image instead of looking at a slide here. Uh, this is the image I'm going to start with. Um, oddly enough, it's titled Shoes. And I just recently did a sort of a street photography project in New York where I shot uh, basically all day long, every day for about eight days. Um, New York is a wonderful place for that, and this was a group of um, young adults that uh, were just hanging out. And although I did some face portraits, I just like uh, the idea of how their, their body language and their clothing, in particular their shoes and stuff, uh, um, really sort of said something about them. So uh, we'll use this image. And what I'm going to do is um, I'm going to end up using Detail 3 on this, and I'm going to do it in layers. And I'm going to start with Photoshop. Nicole mentioned Photo Effects Lab, and I'm going to show you that too. Um, I'm all about efficiency, so I'll address that as we go through this. However, not everybody owns Photoshop. Not everybody wants to purchase Photoshop. And so I'm also going to show this in Photo Effects Lab, which is... Um, not only a great hub, Topaz plugins, it centralizes everything, but it also has a lot of really important adjustments that, that prior to that you pretty much only got in Photoshop, like layers and masking and a bunch of other adjustments. So let's first um, bring this image into Photoshop. That's going to be our starting point. And um, for those of you that are not familiar with what you're looking at, this is Lightroom, and that's sort of the hub for my digital photo life, if you will. Lightroom is a great program for um, keeping all your images together. You can keyword them. I've got over 60,000 images in this library. I can find one in the blink of an eye. I can do basic adjustments, printing, all kinds of stuff. So it's a great, it's a great digital hub. Uh, to go into Photoshop, uh, I'm just going to right click. Um, if you don't have a right click, you can do, I believe it's a control click on a Mac. I think most PCs have a right click. I'm on a Mac and my, I just program my mouse for a right click. So I go down to Edit In, I'm going to go into Photoshop, and of course I want to, you see I have three options here, I, I want to pick a copy, I don't want to work on my original. And so there I am in uh, Photoshop with my, um, with my image of the shoes. And over on the right is where I have all my palettes, and the most important one we're going to be working with is down here in the lower right, which is uh, the layers. And that's the reason we're going to be doing this from Photoshop is because I'm going to be going into detail multiple times uh, to accomplish my sharpening workflow and adding a sense of depth, and I'm going to do each of those in a layer. Um, and the reason I, I want to do it in um, a layer is so that I can make adjustments later and separate the various functions. So the first thing I'm going to do is duplicate this layer. Like everything else in Photoshop, there's a, a number of ways to do this. The way I like to do it is just to click it, drag it down to this little dog-eared icon, with, which is the layer icon. Voila, it makes a copy. And I'm a big fan of labeling layers so that I remember what I did later and I know where I went with it and all that. So I'm going to detail three, and this is going to be capture sharpen, okay? Now, let's take a look at this. We're at 50%. Um, I'm going to go to 100% here. 
on the image just so you can take a look. Um, and I, w I would think that most of you looking at that would say, oh, well, that looks pretty sharp, Joel. And it does look pretty sharp. In fact, I shot it on a camera that has very minimal anti-aliasing on it. Um, and so it comes out of the camera a little sharper. This is a Nikon D800E. It comes out a, a little sharper out of the camera than, say, my Canon would. So um, we go into detail three and how we're going to bring back some detail that's um, that's there that we're not really seeing very apparently. So the way I do that, you see I'm going up to the upper menu in the upper left here, pull down menu. Um, I'm going to go down under the filter menu to Topaz Labs, and there's a sub-menu with all of my Topaz filters, and I'm going to pick Detail 3. So what happens is it's just uh, Topaz plays nicely with Photoshop and Lightroom and all these programs. It launches me right in to Detail 3. Um, those of you that are familiar with the Topaz plugins, it has a very familiar layout. As far as the interface, we have um, on the left, we have uh, what are called presets and collections. Uh, a preset is just a, a set um, a set of settings <laughs> that's um, predefined that uh, Topaz uh, gives you with the program. You can also create your own and save your own presets as well. Um, the controls are on the right here, uh, and you can see uh, if I click on one of these. I'll click on micro contrast enhancement and you can see it adjusted some of the sliders over on the right. What I generally do when I first come into any of these plugins and it's usually in the lower right here there's a button that says reset all and that's what I'm going to do. I want everything to be on zero. I want to start with my base image and I want you to be able to see what's going on so I'm going to enlarge this to one to one. Uh, you see in the upper right here where the navigator is um, there are some buttons to go plus and minus magnification and one to one. So we're at 100%. And again, there is there is a, an initial impression of sharpness. But watch what happens when I I'm going to start with this micro contrast enhancement one. And you see all of a sudden now we can see the very clearly the stitching in the shoes, the texture in the suede. So there's the before. Um, look carefully and you can you know look at the stitching and the suede and the shoes and that sort of thing now um, when I go to the after you can see there's a fair amount more detail there so I think that's a pretty good starting point I'm just gonna look around a little bit at this and see how it looks as far as the rest of the image now for capture sharpening um, basically all I ever use for the most part is just the small detail slider. You notice there's this other thing called boost and what that does is that works on small detail that you really don't see with your eye even at one to one like this. Um, and it added a little bit with this preset just as a safety measure I'm gonna zero that out and I do that by double clicking on the boost. Boost is not something we generally want to use for capture sharpening. This is an image that has detail everywhere, so you're not seeing so much the effects of that boost. But if we had areas that we normally don't want to sharpen, like a sky in a landscape or the skin on somebody's face in a portrait, um, that's where you would start to see some artifacts from this boost. So basically, we're pretty much done here with the capture sharpening. And I'm just going to say, OK. And it's going to apply it, and it takes me back into Photoshop. And here it is in my in my layer there. So um, again, looking at it 100%, if I click on the little eyeball, that turns off the layer. So there's a before, and there's an after. And uh, again, fairly subtle, but we're just trying. This one was already fairly sharp to begin with. We're just trying to bring back a little. There's the after again. Now, if you scrutinize this thing, when I go when I move over to the lower left corner of this photo. The guy in the white shoes, his shoes just aren't as sharp as, say, all these shoes that are more towards the center. Okay, um, Hopefully you're able to see that a little bit, and you'll probably see it more when we do the selective sharpening. And the reason for that is it's just the physics of the lens. The lens is not as sharp in the far corner, which is kind of where this guy and his shoes are, uh, versus the center. You can see even the sidewalk doesn't look as sharp. The rocks aren't as well defined, etc. But we're really... Because the shoes are an important part of the image, this is this is an ideal application of 
selective or creative sharpening. So I'm going to create a new layer to accomplish that. And all I'm going to do is I'll, I'll go over here again to the lower right. Um, I'm going to pull this down to that little dog-eared icon and make another layer and immediately relabel it. Um, we are going to be using detail again here, but this time we're going to be doing selective sharpening. So I'm going to label it so that I remember what, what it is that I did with that particular layer. So again, we go up to the filter menu up on top with the pull down, pull down to Topaz Labs, go into Topaz Detail 3, and it'll bring us back into detail. And um, first thing I'm going to do is reset all so that we're back to our starting point and all our sliders here are at zero. And I'm going to magnify it so you can see. Now, before we just talked about the small detail slider, and we've already sort of taken care of um, the capture sharpening that way. Um, one thing I want to mention here is that when um, just taking a step back to the capture sharpening, um, I could have gone a little more with it. Uh, the problem is you want to sort of look at the sharpest part of the image and don't over sharpen it when you're doing capture sharpening. Uh, the reason being as you go through the rest of the process with your photo, you might be doing contrast adjustments, you might be adding depth, and all of those things uh, can add contrast to the image and visually it can fool us in the, in the sense that it, it looks a little sharper. So you don't want things to look over sharpened because then they can start looking sort of more illustrative or sort of cartoonish and kind of funky. So um, I'm a little conservative. Um, I'd rather err on the underside than the overside on the capture sharpening. But now we're going to do the selective sharpening. And again, this guy's shoes are a little bit soft. So back to these sliders here, before where we were using small detail, we will use that somewhat, but we're also going to use these other ones. And the medium and large detail are pretty much what they sound like. Large detail might be things like clouds in the sky or bigger objects, uh, medium details in between. Um, so the medium detail, if I just do that and nothing else, watch, just look at the guy's shoes. It's affecting the laces and kind of the broader areas. I'll move it all the way over, the broader areas of the shoes. So that's just medium detail. And if I just do small detail, that was like we were doing with the um, capture part of this. Um, again, I way overcooked it here, but you get the idea. So we're gonna. So what we want in this case is a combination. So what I'm gonna do is bring up the small detail, and again, I'm just I'm just looking at the shoes here, okay? Um, and it looks the rest of the photo looks terrible but we don't, we're not worrying about that. We're going to end up masking it out and then just selectively brushing in the sharpening. So I'm going to bring up the medium detail a little too and I'm just looking at his shoes. Now to me they look slightly overdone. In the capture sharpening phase that's okay. Um, it's going to be in a layer we can back it off and um, we can brush it in at different opacities even if we wanted to. Um, however his shoes are fairly even so we'll um, just create a mask after this and I'll show you how I'm going to do that. So again, the, the whole photo, if we look at it, looks terrible but we're not um, we're not going to be sharpening anything but the shoes in this case. So I'm going to say OK and that brings me uh, back into Photoshop and here's my select sharpen. OK, so here's before we did any of that, that's just with the capture sharpen. I'll even uncheck this layer, that's with no capture sharpen. So I, I uh, here, let me move this over just a little bit. So I select the capture sharpen, all right, and that brought back our our detail so that we have a little you know fine detail everywhere. This looks awful, so we're going to put a mask in there. So this time I'll use the menu up here, go to layer. Um, I'm going to do layer mask and hide all. And you see immediately in my layer palette over here, um, it created a little icon for the layer. It's all black which means it's hiding everything. And that's the way masks work. A mask, if it's all black, it hides it. If it's white, it reveals it. And shades of gray, it doesn't in between. So it allows you to tweak things with the mask. Um, what I'm going to do now is brush back in the effect that I want. So I'm going to go over to the Tools palette on the left. I'm going to grab the brush, select the Brush tool. And I'm 
going up here to the top, if you follow my cursor up here, it says opacity 100%. That's fine. I'm going to leave it there. If I wanted to gradually brush something in, I might use a lower opacity and just keep going over and over until I get it where I want. Um, but in this case, I'm just working on one area, um, and I'll probably just end up adjusting it with the opacity of the whole layer since, since um, that's, we're just affecting one part of it. Um, as far as adjusting the brush size, this is a neat little trick in Photoshop. If you hold down the Control and Option key on a Mac or Control Alt on a PC, you can move your um, mouse or wh whatever back and forth, and that changes the size. And as you move it up and down, that controls um, how soft the edge is on the brush, how much feather you get. So what I'm going to do is just start brushing this back in just on the shoes because that's all we're interested in. And I'm going to do both shoes here. All right, and that's looking pretty good. However, let's look at this in context. If you look at this guy's shoes now compared to the other shoes in there, let me just move it over a little bit, um, they're almost a little overdone. Again, because we put it in a layer, that's not a problem. So I'm going to go over to my layers palette, and here you see opacity. If I move that all the way to the left, you can see um, I've gotten rid of all the sharpening in his shoes and all the way to the right, it's a little bit too much. So I'm just going to back it off a bit. Oh, I'd say probably right there. I think it's a good match for the rest of the shoes so that they're all kind of equal. So now we've got our selective or creative sharpening done. And the other thing I want to do yet here is this is this is two thirds of our sharpening workflow now. But before we do output, what I want to do is make this image a little bit more three dimensional. Uh, uh, let me bring it down in size here a bit. If you look at this, you can tell by looking at the shadows I shot on kind of a, a somewhat overcast sort of hazy day. It wasn't completely cloudy, so I had some shadows, but they're pretty subtle. And although there is some separation between the shoes and the legs and the wall and everything. Um, we can actually make that a little bit more three-dimensional by, um, by adding depth. Um, so I'm going to show you uh, one technique for doing that. Uh, we want to start with a layer again, a new layer, and we want that layer to be the accumulated effect of everything we've done so far. If I simply go up to this top layer and duplicate it again, I'm also duplicating the mask, and I don't want to do that. So the way I do it is I'll do it down in the palette this time instead of the menu. So I hold down the Option key, Alt on a PC, click on this menu, and do Merge Visible. Now, you can do the same thing up here in the Layer menu. I'll hold down the Option key or Alt on a PC and say Merge Visible. Now what the Option does is it it, the merge visible would flatten everything, but we don't want to do that. We want to create it in a new layer. So it merges all those into a new layer. And again, I'm going to use Detail 3. Um, shows you how versatile this is. Detail 3, that is. And I'm going to call this Add Depth. And I'll show you another way to do that in the next image, too. So what I'm going to do now, again, go, go up to Filter. And I'm going to go to Topaz Labs. And I will go down to, whoops, I passed it, Detail 3. And that will bring me right back into Detail 3. Again, I'm going to hit this Reset All because I want to start from where I left off in Photoshop with that last layer. And here we're just looking at um, getting a, set, a sense of depth. So I'm going to enlarge the image to 50%. Now, what I want to mention here, in terms of the different magnifications, in case some of you are wondering, when we're doing um, detailed sharpening, either capture or creative sharpening, um, I tend to work at one-to-one -one <clears throat> so I can see exactly what the brush is doing or what the effect is doing. Uh, the reason for using 50%, I found that to be a good magnification to give you a, an approximate representation of, of how the image would look when it's printed at a normal viewing distance and even maybe even scrutinizing it a little bit. Um, one to one is not realistic for viewing a print because one to one is the equivalent of sticking your nose right in front of a very large print. Um, 
if you bring it down to 50%, to me that's more the equivalent of, say, a normal viewing distance or even scrutinizing an actual print. Um, and uh, so that's just a little a little tip you can use in terms of viewing this. And I like to use this for checking the depth aspect of things too. So for the add depth, um, I'm not even going to use a small detail because we use that for the other uh, for for the sharpening pretty much. I'm just going to be using uh, medium and large detail to just add a hint of third dimension here. Now, there are some good presets for this, too. Over on the left here, you see all these that say overall detail, light, medium, and strong, and then there's one and two. I would highly encourage you to play around with those um, as, a, as a good starting point. So, in fact, I'll just do that right now. So, on the light here, um, it, it immediately enhances the shadows and the edges and contrast and whatnot. So let me do a before. There's before. Now look at this carefully, and especially look um, right up here where this guy's knees, where he's doing the gestures with his legs, and um, her with the uh, with her knee out, and the foot kicked out here relative to the wall. And then when I go to the after, it just adds a little bit more sense of dimension there. The drawback I have going here is I really, again, I don't want to be working with the small detail. If you go up to one to one, it's overdoing it a little bit. I'm going to zero that out. A little trick for zeroing things out is to double click on these names. So if I have small detail over here and I want to zero it out, I just put the cursor right over small detail, double click, brings it back to zero. So I'm going to go back to that 50% just so we can get an idea. I'll do a quick before and after again. So there's before, there's after. Fairly subtle. Hopefully you can see this through the webinar. And it just gives me that psychological sense of uh, a little more of three dimensions. So we'll say OK, pop right back into Photoshop here. And let's take a look at that again. There's before, there's after, and this is just that add depth aspect of it. So now we're pretty much done with this image. Um, I can save it off and pop back into Lightroom. And um, when I go back into Lightroom, so here's, here's the one I just did, and here's where we started. And what I'm going to do is just show you the difference. OK, it, it's fairly subtle, but this is where we started before we did any uh, content, or sorry, before we did any capture sharpening and then or creative sharpening or the sense of depth. And there's the after effect after we've added all of those. So it's sharper, it's crisper, and it's a little more three-dimensional. Um, and you can really see it, see that three dimension when you look at the separation between the legs and the wall. Um, so now all we have left to do is output. Now we talked about output sharpening just being math. However, it's it, it's math in the sense that you have to cal uh, you would if you were going to calculate it, you'd have to do it for the size and whatever your media output is. So. One of the beauties of Lightroom is somebody's done all that work for me. Um, if, if you're really interested in how all this is figured out, um, if um, there's this sort of geeky book <laughs> for, the, for those of us that are geeks called Real World Image Sharpening. It's 300 pages on nothing but sharpening. And um, actually, you know what? I'm going to read one, two sentences out of this book because um, this is about sharpening for output. It says we're, um, and, and the author is, authors are Bruce Frazier and Jeff Shiwi. Anyway, it's called Real World Image Sharpening. Um, I don't think they've done an edition since a few years ago, but it's still, it's still a valid book if you're into that stuff. But I think this sentence is, is good. Where optimizing for content and creative sharpening require human skill, sharpening for output is essentially a deterministic process since any given print process turns pixels into marks on paper the same way no matter the input. Creativity at this stage is not only unnecessary, but should be actively discouraged. So um, essentially he's saying uh, when you want to mess with it is the capture and creative sharpening, but on the output um, it's just the math. So what I'm going to do is, is um, pick the one that we just worked on, and in Lightroom I can simply go to the print module here if I were to print this as my output. 
And if you look over on the right, this is just all the stuff pertaining to setting it up for printing. But if you notice right here where my cursor is on the right about the middle, there's a little checkbox that says print sharpening. Um, and my options are low standard and high, glossy and matte. Now, those cover almost um, any type of thing you would want to print. The glossy you would also use for, say, luster or um, exhibition fiber paper, something that's fairly smooth and, and high acutance. Um, and then the amount, um, you can vary simply for the fact that you might, for, let's say, a matte, media, you might be printing on Velvet Fine Art, which is a lot smoother than something like Canvas, even though they both have a lot of texture. So you might need the high on the Canvas, and you might use the standard on the other one. If it's on matte versus glossy, it's going to add more sharpening, because with a matte surface, there's a lot more ink spread, and you lose a little more sharpness in the output. That's the whole reason for output sharpening, is you lose a little bit when ink hits the paper, um, or when you drastically downsize your image, let's say for the web, um, you're going to lose a lot of quality going from a 20 or 30 megapixel image down to just a few hundred pixels. Uh, so th the great thing is that uh, all you have to do is check a box and click some options here. Now, nothing substitutes for an actual test print. So I highly encourage you to do test prints. I always do a test print. I realize both Lightroom and Photoshop have soft proofing built in. Um, in uh, 20 plus years of digital printing, I can't say that I've ever been able to count on soft proofing 100%. Um, it's just a representation. So um, even going all the way back to my wet darkroom days, <laughs> I've always done test prints, and I still do. And I also do a sharpen test. And the way I do that is I, I just take a section of the image at the actual size I'm printing it, and um, rather than doing the whole thing, I don't have to use as much media that way. So I take a section representative of what I want sharp, and I do a sharpening test, and, and so I'll run it. Um, typically, I start with the standard, and I choose whether it's matte or glossy, and then I decide whether I need to go more or less from there. Um, invariably, the standard works pretty well, um, but you kind of need to test that yourself just to make sure. Now, let's say we're going out to the web with this. Um, I often use this module in Lightroom to make uh, sort of quick and easy, nice-looking websites. And if you're doing a whole group of images like this, this is really handy. Again, we have all these different parameters for the website. Um, but if you, if you look at the image size here, you can adjust the image size. And then further down here is the sharpening checkbox. And over on the right here, and again, you have that same standard low and high. Um, and this will base it on whatever size you've chosen for the image up here. So um, let's just throw an image up here. You know, and and this is uh, it takes a little while to re redraw for me here. So there's a 400 and some pixel, there's a thousand pixel one, and it'll it'll determine the sharpening based on that size. Again, it's just math. No point in reinventing the wheel. This is the way I do it. I just let Lightroom do it. Now, if you don't happen to have Lightroom or you prefer to print in Photoshop, the guys who came up with the um, that did all the calculations and came up with the um, sharpening algorithms for Lightroom. Uh, it's a group called Pixel Genius. They have a product called PhotoKit Sharpener. Um, you can use that if you want the same sort of automation like this, but from Photoshop instead of Lightroom. Uh, and if you're just, it, it, as long as we're talking about going out um, to a web image here, um, if you're just doing one or two images, I'll go back into my library module. If you're just doing one or two images, um, I can click on the export here, and this is just another way of doing it. Um, if you notice, you set all different parameters here to create your export image. But um, you know, here I would pick JPEG because that's what I'm doing, and I might only be doing, let's say, a 500 pixel image where it says resize to fit. I'm picking 500 pixels on the long edge, and and this could be whatever for whatever your purpose is. But you notice again, here's that sharpen checkbox, and you decide whether you're going to the screen, which would be for the web matter glossy paper and again you have those different amounts you can choose so handy little deal I should mention you can certainly use detail 3 for doing output sharpening but you really need to know what you're doing um, and so if you're gonna go that route and do it try to do output sharpening manually through Photoshop or detail 3 or something like that I would I would recommend getting that book I mentioned um, otherwise 
I think it's easiest just to do it through something like Lightroom. Now let's go to another image since we've sort of completed this one and I'm picking something completely different here. Um, we've got a landscape, there's some architecture here, there's a person in it and it's black and white. So i um, trying to get everything done here with about two images. <laughs> so in this one, again, we want to start with Capture Sharp, and this time I'm going to go through Photo Effects Lab. So this time, instead of Edit in Photoshop, I'm going to do Edit in Photo Effects Lab. Again, I want to do a copy of it. I don't want to work on my original. And this should pop me in the Photo Effects Lab. Um, Topaz plays very nicely with Lightroom and Aperture and some of these programs. So I'm in Photo Effects Lab. Again, similar layout to what you see in all the Topaz products. Um, over on the left are presets. They have little previews with them. Um, and there's different tabs. And in this case, I'm going to click on the Plugins tab. And look at that. There's all my plugins. This is pretty cool. So this is my hub for dealing with Lightroom plugins. Um, I haven't counted these, but I bet I have probably everything Topaz makes there. So whatever, whatever ones you have installed on your system will show up here. If you only have four of them, then just four of them will show up there. Um, but it's a really neat way to to use them and stay in the same place. And the beauty of this is over on the right, um, where I have my controls, I also have layers. And they work very similarly to Photoshop. Uh, so the first thing I want to do is to duplicate this layer. And uh, just like in Photoshop, I can drag and drop it. In this case, they use the word duplicate. I'm immediately going to relabel this to detail. Whoops. I left some. Detail 3, and this is going to be Capture, Sharpen, okay? And now to launch into it, we simply go over here, pick our plugin, which in this case is going to be Detail 3. I'm going to start that up. And here I am in Detail 3. And we want to look at this at 1 to 1 for the Capture Sharpen. And remember what I said, we want to sort of uh, hone in on what's going to be the sharpest part of the image. Now if we look at this again, there's sort of a general sense that it's pretty sharp here. We can see individual blades of grass, we can see bricks and tiles and all kinds of stuff. Um, but just having done this so much, I can, I can tell right away I shot this on the Canon um, because they have a little bit stronger anti-aliasing than on that special version of the Nikon body I have. And so we want to bring that back uh, with the small detail. And I'll try the presets first. So we'll do uh, micro contrast one and we'll do two. Uh, there's the two. Now the two uh, is a little over a little overdone. The one, there's the one again. That's not quite enough. So I'm going to go in between. Now if you look over on the right, um, it's saying 15 on the small detail, 25 when I hit the number two. So I'm going to go in between to 20. And that looks pretty good. And what I'm looking at actually is this area in here because this has the most detail. So I don't want to overcook that. Um, as If you look, we have that same kind of issue with the lens uh, where it sort of falls off towards the far edge and it's not quite as sharp. But we'll take care of that when we get to the uh, creative sharpen. Now what I want to do is go up to the sky here and show you. Um, you see there's, there's all this kind of noise in the sky. Part of that is the boost, so I'm going to zero that out, and that helps a little. Um, but just by by doing the overall sharpening uh, with the small detail, we're still getting a little bit of noise here in the sky. So let me go to the before. You can see it. It's you can hardly see it. It's really not evident at all. Now there's the after. You can start to see just a little bit of texture in this part of the sky. Now it's not evident everywhere. Um, when we go to the lighter parts of the sky, you don't really see much. Um, but this is easy enough to take care of with masking. Uh, and I'll show you, um, we did a little bit of masking before, and we'll do it again this time through Photo Effects Lab. Now, if you notice over on the right here, there's a thing that says Effect Mask, and I could do the masking right from inside detail. So if you don't have Photo Effects Lab, or you don't have Photoshop, um, you can do it right from within here. I like to centralize it just from an efficiency standpoint doing all my masking and opacity changes um, right from within Photo Effects Lab. So we're going to say OK on this. And then I'm just going to show you real quickly how to do a mask. Um, and it's basically similar to the way we did it in Photoshop. So um, I can go up here to the upper right. You see there's all these different tabs. 
if I click on mask, when I look down here in my layer, now the layer, I know I'm I know what layer I'm on because it's selected in blue, but you see this white outline tells me that I've selected the mask. If I go back to adjustments, the other way I can do it is just click on the mask and it automatically brings up the mask tools there. So remember, black hides stuff and white reveals it. So a value of zero is black. If I take it all the way to the other end, it'll be 255. I want black. Um, and I can adjust my brush size here. I'm going to I'm going to do a pretty large brush here and just kind of do broad strokes in here. I'll start out at one to one just so you can see the effect of what's going on. So you can see we have that we have great great detail brought back in the rest of the image, but we kind of don't like this noise in the sky. So I'm going to grab a, a a broad brush here, and you see as I brush over that, it's kind of disappearing. Here, let me undo that. There it is. Um, before the brushing, there it is after the brushing. I'm going to go back to a smaller size and just, for insurance sake, just brush in, especially these dark areas we're showing them the most. And you notice um, that it wasn't very offensive and it wasn't in the light area as much, so I'm just doing kind of a general broad brush stroke here. I'm not so concerned about taking it right to the edges of the building or anything like that. So um, let's look at one to one again. Um, looking at the building here, um, I'm going to unclick this layer. Okay, that's before the capture sharpening, and there's after the capture sharpening. And I do see a few areas I want to I want to add a little extra sharpening to. Um, and this time I'm going to do this right from within Photo Effects Lab. So I'm going to make a new layer, and instead of duplicate, I'm going to do from stack, which is the same thing we did. Um, with the merge visible option in Photoshop, it's just easier and simpler in Photo Effects Lab because uh, you just it's just one click and it um, stacks the other layers into a new one. So we're going to call this. Um, I'm going to put Photo PFXL here for Photo Effects Lab, and we're going to call this um, Selective. Oops, can't spell Selective Sharpening. All right. And I'm going to do that with the brush tools up here. So I click on the brush tab. There's this thing called Smooth and Detail. Okay, if I use a negative value and I brush in, um, it makes it blurry. Um, I'll reset that. And if I go all the way to the right, that's sharpening. And that's way, way, way too much. So I'll reset that. We'll probably uh, take, we'll take it to a positive number, let's say 25-ish, okay? And now I'm going to go in and brush the parts that that I want to do. If I can get my brush back here. Ah, there we go. So I'm going to brush in this tree a little bit. And then I want to move over here. I'm going to make my brush a little smaller now. Work on some other areas. This little tree in here, through the window. Then I'm going to work on some of these windows here. It's a little weak here because of the that whole um, sharpness fall off with the lens. And I'll go right to the end of this wall, and probably this building over here on the right needs it a little bit too. So this is what I mean by the selective or creative sharpening. Um, in this case, it's a landscape sort of, and I've got everything in focus, so. Here I'm kind of correcting for some, some issues with the lens, but I don't want to have areas of blurriness. Um, let me get to the overall here. So what I've done now is I've got my creative sharpening done, but if we do look at this at one-to-one, -one, it might be just slightly overdone. Um, I'm going to move it off to the left here. You can see if you look at this wall, it's almost a little too sharp compared to the rest. The same issue we had with those shoes, but that's why I did it in a layer. So I'm going to bring, if I bring the opacity all the way to the left, take a look at that. Um, there's no extra sharpening there all the way to the right. Um, it's a little overdone, so I'm going to back it off. Oh, probably right in there. It looks pretty good. And now, now the, those sharpened areas kind of match the rest of the image. So the last thing that I want to do here is to add a little depth. And I'm going to do that using clarity instead of detail, just so you can see another plugin that's 
um, are a very useful one. Uh, Clarity is a fairly new one from Topaz. I'm going to create a new layer from stack and we're going to call this add depth. Um, and I like to name what plugin I'm using too, so Clarity Add Depth. So then I'm going to go over here, I'm going to find Clarity, pop in there. And again, I kind of like to look at this at maybe 50% or so. And believe it or not, all right, so again, we have the collections and the presets here. The one I found most useful on a lot of landscapes and architecture shots for adding depth is this one called Midday One. Now, there it is, and definitely we have more sense of depth there. There's the before, there's the after. Um, it's a little too much for me, the effect. Um, it's, it's drifting a little bit too far from the tonality that I liked in this, but I still like the sense of depth. So. Again, if I didn't, if I weren't using Photo Effects Lab, I could back off on the opacity right here. I could do masking right from within Clarity. I'm not going to go too much into Clarity here because that could be a whole seminar unto itself. But I just wanted to show you uh, sort of another way to do it. So depending what plugins you have, you can figure out your most efficient workflow for this. Um, but just from that that efficiency standpoint, instead of tweaking the image here in Clarity because I'm mostly going to be dealing with just backing it off a little bit, I'm going to do that right from within Photo Effects Lab. So I'm going to click OK, and it applies everything, brings me back into Photo Effects Lab. Let's look at it at 50% again. I'm going to uncheck it, and there I'm going to check it again a little too much. So I'm going to bring my opacity slider down, and this will affect whatever layer is selected, which is outlined in blue. Again, I go all the way to the left, no effect, all the way to the right, full effect. Um, we're going to go about 80%. The other thing I notice is it's just a tiny bit darker than I wanted it. So I'm going to back off on the exposure. Sorry, I'm going to brighten it up a little bit. So maybe just like a third of a stop here. And so now if we do the before and after, you can see our tonality is about the same in terms of the exposure. But when I click on this, I definitely get that sense of depth. Well, just look at the separation. This is the before. Check out the separation with Barb between Barb and the building and the building and the sky. And it's um, just that again that little psychological effect of of adding a little bit of depth. So now I'm pretty much ready to go with the image. If I was really going to tweak this thing, um, I might just use the masking tools in here. Um, and and brush out some of this brush out some of this um, effect in the foreground and the grass because I think it just added a little too much detail. So um, again, the broad brush strokes like we did in in some of the other ones. Um, that's a real minor tweak, but I just I just like the look of it better. Um, here I'll go to 50 percent. Um, I don't like the grass, the busyness of it being, you know, more contrasty interfering. So to me, that's perfect. Um, and let's go back to Lightroom, and we can kind of do uh, a before and after. Let's see, there it is. Whoops. All right. So I'm just going to show you real quick. There's where we started. There's where we ended up. Definitely pops more. We've got more dimension. We fixed the sharpening before and after. Okay, let's see. We've got looks like seven or eight minutes left. Um, I'm going to show you something really quick, and then I'm going to open it up to questions. Um, I just want to show um, the re one of the reasons I use detail for a lot for sharpening different types of sharpening. I can do it in Lightroom, but I'm just going to show you here. Um, this beautiful baby happens to be my daughter, and uh, she has very big eyes. Uh, we'll zoom in on those eyes. And um, they're already pretty sharp, but what I want to show you here is um, sharpening in Lightroom. Now, the reason it looks so sharp is because I already sharpened it. Let me go back to the original here. So. Um, 
my sharpening control is over on the right here, and as I move this slider over, you see it gets sharper and sharper. Now, what happens is when I get the eyelashes to where I like them, if you look right here in the eye where, my, where the little hand is, the eyelashes look great, but you see all these artifacts, sharpening artifacts in the eyes. I generally don't get those with detail, and that's why I like using detail for sharpening. The cool thing about Lightroom is that you can throw a really quick mask on there. I'm holding down the Option key and putting the cursor over the masking, and what's black is not going to be shown, and what's um, white is going to be shown. So this is the masking thing is great. The problem is I still have those artifacts in the sharpening. So I would say maybe a third of the time I can use Lightroom, and the rest of the time I'm going to use the workflow I just showed you for sharpening and output. So. There we are. We've got a few minutes for questions, and uh, I'd be happy to answer some that you have. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joel. We have a ton of questions coming through. Um, we had quite a few people asking Alan and William if um, any capture sharpening was applied when you imported the raw image into Lightroom. Um, it, okay. S so if I'm understanding the question correctly, you're wondering if I'm applying uh, sharpening on the fly, uh, which you can do in Lightroom, and the answer is no, I don't do that. Um, I prefer to do, um, I just import the raw image. Occasionally I'll throw some develop presets on there, things like lens profiles or removing chromatic aberrations, uh, something that I would, on, you know, it's only something that I might do to every single image. Um, and you can actually make those presets specific to camera serial numbers. So if you have a camera that needs something more than another camera, you can do that. But I, I like to control the capture sharpening fairly accurately, so I think it's a tough thing to do on the fly. I, I hope that's answering your question, but I, I do the capture sharpening after I import it. Okay, great. Um, let's see here. Rebecca had asked, uh, so do you not use Unsharp Mask? Uh, she says... So I just lost it. Um, there, she said she was taught to do that, then immediately fade on sharp mask luminosity 100%. And is that? Do you? You know uh, what, Rebecca? What you're? It's a good question. And what you're talking about is um, simply just different ways of doing things. So yes, you can use unsharp masking if you're working from within Photoshop. Um, and I, prior to the tools getting, you know, prior to to Topaz coming on the scene and coming up with a lot of great plugins, and prior to uh, Lightroom coming up with better tools in their software, I used Photoshop for everything. And I had some pretty elaborate um, contour masks that I would create uh, for capture sharpening, and I made little actions for things like that adding depth and all kinds of stuff. But um, it's gotten to the point now where some of the tools, let's say the Topaz plugins, are really a more efficient way to do it. it. Basically, Photoshop's a Swiss army knife. You can you can accomplish anything in Photoshop, but whether that's the, the most efficient, fastest, or best way to do it is another story. So that, to answer your question, I, um, there, there's nothing wrong with doing it that way. It's a personal preference. Okay, great. All right, Richard had asked, why use capture sharpening since the image will be sharpened on output? Anyway, and then you only have one round of sharpening and less artifacts. What's the benefit of capture sharpening? Well, um, that's a really good question, and uh, I don't really think it's possible to do it all in one pass. Um, the reason being is they're for different reasons. For one thing, your output sharpening is totally contingent on the size and the media, so it's the very last step. Um, in the old days, prior to all these great tools, the sharpening there it was there was a one-pass sharpening method. So when you put your piece of film or your print on the drum scanner, you applied you applied unsharp masking, which is a type of sharpening, to the image in one pass. But it but it was done to the exact size and line screen that you were going to print it. So that's the problem. Is if you were to apply if you were to apply enough the amount of sharpening you would need for a given output, especially something like a printing press, but even an inkjet printer, the amount of sharpening required for that is you, you won't know the amount because you won't know the size you're printing. So that's, you know, that's sort of an unknown variable at the beginning of the process. And the capture sharpening is, is a fairly subtle step, and it's just to recover what was lost in the capture 
or conversion process if you were scanning film. So that's that's the reason we separate those out. And I think the capture, uh, sorry, the creative and selective sharpening is kind of obvious. You might want to accentuate the eyes in a portrait or, or in the case of the examples I showed today to um, make up for some loss of sharpening due to um, the physics of the lens. So um, that's the main reason is because the output is, is totally contingent on the size and the type of media you're going to. You know, the web, a small web photo is going to be very, very different type and amount of sharpening than anything else. So you want to do that capture. The first two steps of, of the workflow, sharpening workflow, on your master image, so to speak, and then once you decide what you're going out to and, and what size and how you're doing it, that's when you, you do the output sharpening. Um, it would be nice if we could do that all in one step. And if, if, you know, it's possible that you would have a workflow where, let's say you're in a production situation and all you ever do all day long every day is 11 by 17 prints on glossy paper with an Epson inkjet, uh, great. Then you could probably figure out a way to do it all in one step. So I hope that answers your question. It's, it's really just a matter of the variety of things that we go out to. Mm -hmm. That definitely answers the question. So I think, I think Richard just wrote in saying, great explanation. <laughs> oh, okay. You're welcome, Richard. <laughs> it, was a good, it was a good question, though. I get asked that. Yes, very good question. Yes. All right. Jim had asked, are there any other considerations when sending output to a lab for printing? For example, do most labs sharpen that you know of? Ah, very good question. Okay, this, uh, it varies is the real answer. So the best thing to do is be in communication with your lab. Now if it's me, I mean I do, I do all my, most of my, well pretty much all my printing in-house, but if I, occasionally I have to send out to a lab and if I do, um, I just talk to them and I, I prefer to handle the sharpening if possible. Now if I know, if I've used the lab before and I know they do a good job with output sharpening, I'll leave that step to them. If I'm not so sure, I'll try to get the parameters of what they're doing and work with it that way. And it's especially important, say, with printing presses and things like that. So, well, it's actually important with any lab. So just find out what your lab normally does and, you know, you might even want to run a test. Most labs are willing to do a test for you. And then you can determine whether you want to leave the output sharpening to them or whether you want them to give you the specifics of their output device so that you can do it yourself. Um, but it, the two important things with working with a lab are communication and running, running some tests to, to dial it in. So good question, Jim. All right. Uh, let's see here. Sorry, one second. Okay, I had a couple questions about people asking if there were uh, masking capabilities within detail, such as, I think it was um, Terry asked, how do you sharpen eyes in detail if you can't select them? And Terry, just so you know, and everyone else, there are masking, um, there is a masking module within detail itself, so, and the ability to apply within detail itself, so you can continually work on select parts of the images um, with different uh, detail enhancements. Just wanted to answer everybody uh, the, who was asking that. <laughs> yeah, I can, I can just, I can just do, um, I can show this very quickly. So okay. if we go into detail, that was one sh that um, she asked about, right? Mm -hmm. Or you said a lot of people asked about it. Yeah, okay. several people were asking about whether or not it had masking capabilities and also how do you do selective uh, detail enhancements within... Well, I did go over that pretty quickly and, and what I mentioned was that I wasn't going to show the masking in detail because I like to keep it all in one central location, which is... Um, it looks like the sharpening was already done on this. Um, <laughs> I like to do it in one central location, which is um, either Photo Effects Lab or Photoshop, depending uh, which one I'm using. Mm -hmm. And um, here, I'll go back into detail and show you. Um, so you can do it either way, and if if you're gonna if you don't have one of those programs, or you just want to do it from within the plugin, that's fine. Um, it's the same it's the same way that we were doing the creative sharpening, really. So let's say we I'm just gonna really amp it up here. Um, let's say we're only going to do it on one small part of the image. First I, first I bring it up to where I want it. Um, 
then I go click on the effect mask here and I do an invert so that covers it all up in black and then just like we looked in some of these other ones I just pick a brush here and now I can go over here I'll put the flow to 100% so that it's a little more visible um, and then I can just go in whoops I have to put my strength at 100% there then I can just go in and, and you can see brushing in the shoes here I mean this is way more sharpening than I would do but it gives you an idea how to use the masking to um, selectively brush in your sharpening. Great, thank you so for that's how you do showing it. that. Sure. All right, uh, let's see here. I think I had one more question. Uh, do you have a specific printer that you use? Stanley was asking. Well, uh, guess what? I have multiple printers, but um, <clears throat> I'm using I'm using Epson's, and um, I would have to say that the Canon printers are, are equal products. I have not used an HP in years, but as far as inkjets, um, you know, the three top ones out there, or three most popular ones out there are Epson, uh, Canon, and HP. Um, and uh, like I say, I've, I've used Canons recently enough, I can say that uh, they're pretty much equal products. It's a personal preference. It's that whole, like, Canon, Nikon question. Yeah, <laughs> um, I agree. They're, they're, they're both good, you know. They they have their pros and cons. So um, that's that. What I would say is just, um, you know, you might want to try them out. You might like the way one physically works better than the other, or the way the software interface works better on one or the other um, before you choose which one. But the bottom line is, you're not going to end up with a bad product. So that's what I would have to say about it. All right. Well, thank you so much. I know there were a few questions that I might not have got to everybody, but if you do have any, or if you have anything that we didn't get to you, please feel free to send in your question to webinars at topazlabs.com, and we'll try to get that answered for you. So thank you so much, Joel. Everyone has awesome feedback right now going on in the, um, in the responses. Great. So really appreciate all of the information and explaining in detail. Topaz detail, no pun intended. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, you're you're very welcome. It's my pleasure, and uh, thank you all for attending. Uh, if anybody has any questions specific to me, um, feel free to email me too as well, um, and you have that information in the follow-up email. So yes. thank you all, and have a great day. All right, thanks, Joel, and thank you, everybody.